A broken man in desperate need to find new purpose in his life. A man who drinks too much and therefore struggles to deal with the present even as he is haunted by the past. A man of faith who has not given up on his faith or abandoned it, but struggles to see the hand of God at work in it all given his past and his present. He has traveled to Mexico and became a bodyguard for a young girl. He will in time exact a biblical vengeance on people who have it coming. This is Denzel Washington, Dakota Fanning, Christopher Walken, Mickey Rourke, a slew of others, 2004, Man on Fire. Our protagonist and man on fire is former military, special forces, counterinsurgency, black ops, you name it. The man has skills and he has talents, but he has seen a lot and he struggles to live with the things he's seen and the things that he has done. Now semi-retired, at least retired from active military service, he likes to drink. He likes to day drink. He's sort of a functioning alcoholic, although he has its, his moments of dysfunction. He goes to visit his friend, who's a big wig in Mexico City. Also retired military, they go way back. Christopher Walken's character exists in this setting to be a ferryman. He works for the big Japanese corporate executives who have holdings in Mexico City, but who don't feel safe living in Mexico, but live in El Paso on the other side of the border, or stay there when they visit. So his job is sort of security as well. He continually is ferrying people safely back and forth across the border to work and back to their home. Now, he has brought in Denzel Washington into this situation, or at least while he is visiting. He lets him know that there's a possibility of an opening for work. This is a culture in which kidnappings are rife. And if you know anything about that part of the world, especially in that era, it was all, always news. Anybody of any prominence at all, any sort of lucrative assets at all, even just solidly middle class, you were always at danger of your loved ones being kidnapped and held for ransom. The result of this is that there's a widespread industry of kidnapping insurance to help pay your potential kidnappers. There's also government officials, people in the judiciary, Everyone lives in these sort of ultra-secure compounds away from ordinary citizens. It is quite surreal and is almost reminiscent of Soylent Green. Because there is then a market for bodyguards, if you don't have a bodyguard, your insurance policy won't pay out in the event of a kidnapping. Christopher Walken talks Denzel Washington into taking one of these jobs. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be in tip-top condition. You don't have to be a super soldier, but your background is good enough that you can make somewhat of a living doing this. And because you drink, there's a discounted price. It's a really fascinating way that this developed. Of course, as you can probably predict, the girl Dakota Fanning ends up kidnapped and being held for ransom after she has bonded with Creasy, Denzel Washington's character, even named her teddy bear, Creasy Bear, in honor of him. The girl being kidnapped very quickly, they believe that the girl has been killed when the ransom payoff fails and does not pan out. Assuming that the girl is then dead, Denzel Washington goes on a, on a war, the war path of truly epic biblical vengeance upon people. Now, in that regard, it's sort of a revenge film. He goes on the rampage, he says openly, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill everyone involved, everyone who profited, everybody that even opens their eyes at me, presumably looks at me funny. It's an odd euphemism they use in the movie. Uh, he's going to go on the war path and he's going to get them all and then he does. This part of it seems like a very straightforward sort of action movie, revenge, getting justice brutally and savagely. Although as he does, he unravels the plot the all the nuances for how they operate this whole thing between the corrupt police, the corrupt investigators, the the having different people relay the messages and other people re, you know do drop and pick up. It's a very elaborate web that is woven in this whole industry of kidnapping so that people at the top behind it are protected and each pocket of it is isolated from another. It's quite ingenious. They're not banking on uh, Creasy's 
desire, diligence, his fanaticism in tracking them down and his experience in counterinsurgency, he is able to do it, get information through torturing people. It is really something to see. The really outstanding part of this film is how well he gets revenge on these people. And while that may sound petty, we're used to these action sequences and these movies, you know, we, we expect certain things. We expect people to be shot. We expect them to be pummeled. We expect them to be stabbed. And yet, as Creasy deals with each of these individuals to get information and exact punishment, he does it in very creative ways involving things like remote control explosive suppositories in your butt to chopping off fingers one at a time and cauterizing the wounds with a cigarette lighter from a car, the push-in kind. There's a number of ways that you didn't see it coming. It's creative, it's ingenious, and because you're so upset with him and wanting to, this revenge, you get to enjoy the spectacle of it. Of course, by the end, he unravels the whole plot and it ends up being deeper than what you first expected and some of it maybe you did suspect uh, his friend who helped him get the job, I was sure was going to be involved, but, well, you'll have to see the film yourself. By the end, the crime family has had enough. He has done enough damage to them. He has one of their brothers is his captive. They finally agree. It turns out the girl is alive, not dead. Dakota Fanning is returned. But in return, they want not just the crime lord's brother, but they want Denzel. They want their revenge for all the damage he has done through the course of the film to their organization and their business. The joke is sort of on them. He does agree and he goes with them. And though you kind of hope and expect that he's going to like kill them all, he's actually far too weakened from a gunshot that he received. And the indications we get by the end is that as they're driving away with Denzel, it seems that he expires, he dies. They have him, but they never get to have their fun with him, so to speak. Overall, this is one of those Denzel Washington movies that involves the good guy, bad guy, components of faith built in, which we know that this is part of Denzel Washington's thing. It comes out really well. I like this one probably better than all of them, but Crimson Tide, it's odd to see him play someone that is so flawed and struggling to that degree. His struggles are usually more external or they're more in the, the, the romantic, just the emotional, uh, the good guy emotional, need to recover the innocent or something. To have this guy who's haunted by his past, which we don't really get details of it, and to see him drinking and day drinking and see him wanting to commit suicide and attempting it at one point in the film, that it really is unique for Denzel, and it is some of his best work as just being an actor. But this is a great movie. It's one of those things that because of those creative and fun action punishment sequences, you could watch it over and over, even though they're not surprising anymore. They may, they remain clever and, and satisfying because you hate the bad guy. It's a great film. You can watch it over and over. Let me know what you think. I loved it. Man on Fire.